explores what it is to be English and the tension between liberalism and um, authoritarianism. The play itself within the play is kind of a review, so it's uh, lots of sketches put together. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a play with lots of laughter and some poignant moments too. Uh, if you say um, that it also explores what it means to be English, um, what's your conclusion about that and what's the uh, piece's conclusion really? Well, we were very lucky because Alan Bennett, the playwright, came to talk to us in rehearsals not so long ago and we asked him, um, so you know, what conclusions have you drawn? And he, he was very cautious and said, um, oh no, the playwright only asks questions and he doesn't answer them. And in a way, our job is to make those questions as clear as possible. It's ironic, for example, that the play was written in 68, three years before we joined the EEC, the European Economic Community, and we're now putting on the play nearly 50 years later as we started the process to withdraw from that European community. Um, and there are a few moments in the play where the play feels very, very prescient and poignant because of that comparison. If you think the play was written in 68 and is set in 68, but is looking back 50 years from there, and as we are looking back 50 years from now, it's really it has been fascinating to look at some of the parallels. The play that also commemorates those who lost their lives in World War I and explores some of the decadent movements in the 1920s and 30s is taking to the stage a cast of over 50 young people from the local community. In order to do this play, in one sense, you, you almost um, need a history degree because it's so rich with references from the past. But one of the things when Alan Bennett himself came to meet us, we were asking him, you know, what's the deep meaning of this? And uh, his answer to us was very often, oh, no, 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 it's just a joke. So actually, one of the things that we've been working on is bringing out the humour of the play. Um, of course, having a large community ensemble is challenging. We have 52 uh, young men aged between 10 and 19 but you know what that work is almost the most rewarding because you see over time how they take on discipline how their imaginations develop how their social skills develop when with one another, with one another how they develop confidence and um, we hope that we are developing and offering them skills that will stay with them for the rest of their lives being able to uh completely just take on somebody new and be able to um, convince so many people that that's who you are and then just selling that person to them all so really I just felt something I really enjoy. Yeah I love being in front of an audience because then you can just share what you've been working on and it's just really worth it it's great. Yeah. I just feel like I've learned so much working with people like Daniel and Naomi and Tom it's, it's, been, it's been incredible. 40 years on can be seen until the 20th of May. Nicole Ries, for that's Solent. And that's all we have time for now on Last Week Now. But don't forget, you can always get in touch with us on email on news at thatsolent.com if you have stories of your own that you think could make the news. Germ News Network. Hello, Germs. As you know, when ordinary bleaches flash away, we quickly come back. But the mess does extended germ kill clings for longer to help stop germs from coming back. Flash of the flash of the flash. The mess does extended germ kill. Nothing protects as long. Attention. Attention. Prisoner escape, cell block B. All right. That explains it. Red Bull gives you wings. Hey, I'm DJ Barbecue. And I'm a grilling fanatic. Hellman's have sent me around the world to convince four non-grillers that food cooked over fire is the future. Join our journey in Finding Grilltopia. It's not going to be easy. This guy thinks it's barbaric. You take a piece of meat that starts red and then you turn it black. She keeps things nice and precise. Grilling's a bit messy, isn't it? He's not the most adventurous. The most extreme world I've been would be egg noodles. And he couldn't care less about food. I thought cows were frozen for a little while, so... 
Can they resist a world of smoky flavors? Will I transform their taste buds? I want to marry it. Is that weird? Let's find out in Finding Grilltopia. Search Grilltopia on YouTube to watch now. New Hellman's Grilling and Hot Sauces. Take your taste buds to Grilltopia. We all need help sometimes. Support in times of need. Someone to lean on. On your side. Erwin Mitchell Solicitors are widely regarded by experts as the number one personal injury law firm, helping people get the best possible medical care and rehabilitation, as well as compensation. That's why I'm with Erwin Mitchell. Puzzle presents The Next Generation. Stains today will help them get ready for tomorrow. Purcell removes tough stains like tomato sauce, even in a quick wash. Purcell. Dirt is good. Every now and then it's important to give oneself a good old clear out. Whatever that means. <laughs> what? Uh oh. No! <sighs> I'll just keep it tea. A tasty cup of green tea. Delicious. Mmm. Hello and welcome to Talk Solent, the show where we give our opinions on news that's cropped up this week in our region and beyond. I'm Jonathan Hines and we'll be scrutinising seven articles today. Joining us on the sofa, giving us their thoughts and their expertise are Neshla Avey, who we haven't seen for a while. Welcome, Neshla. Thank you. Good to have you on again. And uh, we've also got singer-songwriter Mike Andros Sires and a talk regular food columnist Sarah Ali Chowdhury. First of all, on Talk this evening, returning to the subject of our care homes, and the care of our ageing population. A councillor has highlighted that nearly half of inspected care homes in the Portsmouth area are either inadequate or requiring improvement. Also highlighted in this item is the question of how we can make more care home staff stay in their jobs and be more motivated and fulfilled uh, in them. So, panel, welcome. Um, are you shocked that uh, nearly half of the care homes in, in Portsmouth are either um, inadequate or um, you know could be improved do you find that shocking or mm. is that what you thought it would, I would be I think I sort of knew that anyway <laughs> um, a bit I think uh, they need to be looking at that a little bit in more detail um, probably look into funding or something to help the situation where the staff are concerned as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do you find that shocking Mike uh, nearly half are not as good as they should be that is care homes in, in Portsmouth, did you, did you think it would be more of a minority than that? Um, it well, it's interesting because there have been, you know, television reports that things don't always run as smoothly as they should. So, I mean, it's <coughs> certainly a wake-up call, definitely. Mm. And, uh, yeah, there, there's certainly a lot of disturbing issues that can take place in some of them. Yeah. How can we see a lot of... They, they have a very high turnover of staff as well in, in, in care homes. Mm. Um, a lot of people say that's 
primarily due to, to pay. Um, it's not very well paid. How can we make it a more rewarding environment to work in? How can we make them stay? Raise of pay, I guess, amongst I think other the first things. Thing, well, the care homes, I thought they were making um, a ridiculous amount of money. No, they're really a... poorly paid. The, the, the staff are, it's really it's minimum no, wage, I, mean, I think, if, a lot of them. I thought, but if it was like, a, is it a private, I mean, the private yeah. um, care homes, yeah. I mean, they, they take a lot, don't they, for, for keeping, well, I mean, you know, they're looking after an extended of life or, you know, sort of life care. But um, I thought that, there was a something with the care homes that they had a certain amount. I think it depends on budget or something. Yeah, on the, the I think the private care homes are very different from the council-run mm. care homes. Yeah. And I've heard horrific stories of care homes. But as you say, mm. it's the turnover of staff. And if they're mm. not, the staff aren't treated well, or looked after, and, and not paid very well, they're not going to stay there. It's quite often a stopgap, isn't and it? Sadly, they're going to be abusive to some of the clientele, the people there that do need the help. And I remember in quite recent years there was a big case over at one of them in Bristol, and it got closed down because they were suffering quite bad physical abuse mm. and there was one guy there I think by the name of Wayne and he was being very very nasty and hitting some of the people around not good yeah, that's but just wrong isn't it but totally wrong yeah. yeah do you think that's a very very small minority of, uh, of care staff that might behave in that way I would say I would say just statistically about? yeah on the law of averages <clears throat> I would say that's probably a very small percentage mm. I think like a lot of the horror stories we hear about in the world today it's a small minority that go off the rails. The majority of people know how to behave and they conduct a fairly sensible code, I think. But then I think it goes back to the, back to basics uh, where it's probably lack of staff to actually vet the mm. employees properly to find out the history of them and, and that sort of thing. And then mm. you end up with um, poorly trained staff or yeah. staff of people who shouldn't be there. Yeah. Mm, but you also mm. hear always the bad stories, don't you? And I'm sure there's some good care homes oh, out yeah. there. Oh, yeah. Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. And, and I think, think most care staff are fantastic and, you know, want to do that. I would way. say so. And I think what Nejla's just said, I mean, I think you could say that probably about a lot of things. There's probably more good going on that doesn't get the credit it deserves. But when something negative yeah. and a bit brash has taken place, it's front page covers in the newspapers or whatever or on the news. Um, people will be very quick to point something out if it's bad, but somebody could do 101 good things and it might be brushed under the carpet. Mm. And like so they often say, that's the case. Half, half of the care homes that are bad, the other half are obviously good, aren't they? Because exactly. They that they always no, all, no. Is it all about funding? It's not, it's it's, not it wouldn't just funding, be all about I mean, funding and money. There's yeah. other things as well. Some people, I just don't think, have the right personalities mm. to get into the job. But it's also mm. the management. It's not just the staff, isn't it? It's the way the care homes run. Exactly. And if, if someone hasn't got the enthusiasm and doesn't enjoy their job, they're not going to worry so much, are they? And the fact there are people in care homes who, who, who literally get no visits at all from mm. any friends or family, mm. maybe in months or even yeah. ever, that is shocking. Isn't it? How can mm. that happen? Maybe if there, more people had more visits from family or friends, maybe that would make a huge difference. Yeah, it probably would, actually. Yeah. I mean, on a similar but slightly different subject, <coughs> I, I find it quite irritating when you go into a number of these various banks or some of these express supermarkets and there's literally one person behind the till. <laughs> or there's one cashier open and there's a queue about 10 or 15 feet long. And, um, and in the 70s, when I was a kid growing up, you just didn't see that kind of thing. But really, even in the late 80s, early 90s, for that matter, I mean, if, mm. if six or seven kiosks <coughs> were built, all of them would be open, and just suddenly it changed. And that can be irritating if you're in a bit mm. of a hurry and you're looking at your watch. And that. Mm. Yeah. Now, moving on, as always, never enough time. <laughs> um, uh, Sarah, um, in... The, in the, Later on in the show, you're going to be telling us what you're going to be up to this evening. Yeah. You've got a very exciting appointment this evening. And it, you know, it's, it is sort of linked in with what we've discussed um, with you in, in previous shows. Yeah. So yeah. that's coming up later in the show. We look forward to hearing... A prestigious what, experience. Yes. <laughs> you're going to be rushing off straight after part three. And um, we'll let the viewers know what that's about um, shortly. So moving on to immigration now, and dozens of landlords have been fined across the UK with fines totalling £37,000 in the first eight months last year of a new crackdown on illegal immigrants in rented accommodation in the UK. Around one landlord every four days has been fined. Fines can be up to £3,000 
per tenant. However, so far, only a small number of landlords have been prosecuted. Let's ask our panel, is this measure fueling more discrimination and creating an even more hostile environment mm. for immigrants? So let's start, first of all, if we can, with a yes or no on this one. <laughs> is something like this creating a more hostile environment for immigrants and creating more discrimination? Yes yeah. or no, Nishla? I think it is. Sarah? I don't think it, it, it does. I right. don't think it makes it worse than it already is. Mike, does it create um, a, a more hostile environment for migrants and immigrants? Probably a combination of the two opinions here. I think there's a little bit yes, a little bit no, because there <coughs> are problems and turmoils anyway, but it is going to increase hostile tensions and make things probably a bit more bitter than they are. Mm. So I, I think um, my yep. opinion is probably, yeah, yep. a little bit on the sort of yes and no side mixed really yeah yeah okay mm. so uh, between a yes and a no <laughs> yeah <laughs> if you know what i mean yeah, yeah, almost between. neutral really depending on, the case, right. depending on the case yeah what would you say to those who say that we've been too lax for too long and now we need to to crack down on on people um you know in a combination that shouldn't be in the country well there's so much hypocrisy behind all this because obviously um the politicians and the government of, as a whole have encouraged so many nationalities to come to England for so many years saying it's the land of opportunity, you're going to have much better lives living here and all this and all that. And that's been going on for quite some length of time. But the wicked thing is, and the very strange thing is, is once some of these people do come over here and that they're looking for these um, so-called pots of gold, as it were, then they get stung with these other hostilities like so, if you come over here we're welcoming you but in another hand they're saying naughty naughty don't do this so three now you're saying fine. And Mike that it's abruptly the attitude is abruptly going the other way it's going very very gobbledygook because they're saying come in with one hand and they're basically saying scram in the other hand and to me that doesn't make much sense well, I don't point. know I, don't Sarah, I know you had a few points to make on on this one yeah um, with the immigration rules because then um, <clears throat> What my issue is, it's not necessarily about the people who are the, who are the immigrants, because they obviously know that they're here and they know that they haven't sorted out the correct paperwork that's required or whatever, and they know what's, what they are doing. The people um, or the government who are doing this crackdown on immigration and the, the fees that are being um, requested well that, that people have to pay whether it's in a restaurant if, the, if there are illegal staff in a restaurant or and now they're mm. saying with landlord mm. fines i mean there is no training given in in, in restaurants to say what what we, we you you should or shouldn't look for when somebody comes and applies for a job you're expected to know um yet there is no special training being provided by the government or anything like that and then now they're, they're cracking down on, on um, immigration rules for people, who, you know, for landlords, yet there is no training. So how would these people who, say, for example, you're buying a house to rent, you've already got these um, clauses on mm. your mortgage before you even start, you know, and that's just for your mortgage. And then you finally get a buy-to-let mortgage, for example, and then you get some tenants, which you need to pay your mortgage. And then you get this tenant, and then, oh, they're an immigration... And you, you didn't know, get the paperwork because you didn't know what to do, or yeah, you were why confused would you know? about it, or you just took them on. Why would you know? I mean, if so somebody comes, you're not going to start you, asking them for their phone. I think we've got really. <laughs> about one minute left. Mm. So that leads me to ask, Nashla, do you think some landlords have genuinely taken on tenants in good faith? Well, yeah, I think so. But then there's, there's always the others that turn the blind eye because they're getting the rent, as you say. And I think, like... In the workplace, I know when I was in my last job, um, mm. the first thing they do is give us your passport, give us a photocopy of your passport, all your information to show that you're, you know, you're allowed to work there. But as you say, big company, probably got training, probably got guidelines. If you're a landlord, you've just started, I could go and buy a house. I wouldn't know what to do. Mm. Um, you tend to, as you say, get the references, get someone in and, um, you know, there's no guide. Well, I'm sure there are guidelines, but you tend to not look at it and you just... In, you know, get someone mm. in. Well, I think more importantly, what are they doing with all this money that they're collecting for every time mm. they catch somebody? Where yeah, is this money being point. used? Yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. I'd like to very see the changes. That, I mean, maybe that money could go into funding for these care homes we were just talking yeah. about. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs>
We're putting the world to right on uh, <laughs> talk as always, and we'll continue to do that after um, the break. Of course, if you know stories that we can be talking about, then do email us on talk and that's certain.com or tweet using the hashtag talk Solent. Coming up, we'll be looking at a couple of things catching our eye from the Isle of Wight press. Gran was a social worker before she got dementia. She cared for many children for most of her working life and now she needs caring for. Dementia has taken away the person that she was. As a busy professional, my father would be able to do everything for himself and now he can't do anything at all. Every year, 225,000 people in the UK develop dementia. It can happen to you, your loved ones, anyone. But it's not an inevitable part of aging. That's why Alzheimer's Research UK wants you to have this free information pack. It will tell you about the things you could do to help reduce your risk of developing dementia, as well as some of the early signs and what to do if you're worried. Call 0800 035 5984 or text RISK3 to 78866 for your free pack. Because this pack gives you everything you need to know about reducing your risk of dementia. With the Glasses Direct Free Home Trial, get four pairs to try out at home for free. They're great. Test drive your new glasses today and see if you could save at Glasses Direct. Germ News Network. Hello, Germs. As you know, when ordinary bleaches flash away, we quickly come back. When the mess does extended germ kill clings for longer to help stop germs from coming back, flash of the flash of the flash. The mess does extended germ kill. Nothing protects us long. This incredible beauty product appears to temporarily reverse time and leave you looking years younger in under a minute. Look at the dramatic results women like you are experiencing every day. See how Ava's eye bags were transformed in under a minute and Diana's wrinkles disappeared before her eyes. What is the secret to these wonderful results? Revealing Rock's Flawless Eyes, the beauty gel that gets to work in under 60 seconds and lasts for up to 10 hours, day or night. Look, apply just a tiny amount of Rock's and see the dramatic change to your eyes less than a minute later. Well, it really, really works. I mean, I just, I can't believe it. It's unbelievable. Would the legend that there be any product that make, would make such a big difference as that? I'm amazed. I've been looking for something like that for 30 years. The Rock's Flawless Eyes Formula has been developed to give you the power of multiple products in one and has been independently proven to temporarily reduce three of the main visible signs of facial aging. Fine lines, puffy eyes and wrinkles. Rocks normally retails for $59.95 by our web stores, but we want to make this incredible beauty product accessible to everyone. So call or click to order and you'll receive your first bottle of Rocks half price. That's just $29.95. Once you've tried it, we know you'll always want to look your best. So ask our operators about special multi-buy discounts with additional savings of up to 75%. Join the Rocks revolution and you could look years younger too. Give Rocks a try for flawless eyes now. A warm welcome back to Talk Soul and the talk show where we discuss a variety of press articles from our Solent area and a couple of national and international too. Uh, we're going over to the, uh, going to be having a look at the uh, Isle of Wight press in just a few moments. But first of all, uh, Sarah, Sarah Ali Chowdhury, one of our regular panellists, um, Indian food columnist, campaigner, entrepreneur, <laughs> reality TV star. Oh. <laughs> of course, you were in, um, in My Kitchen Rules on BBC Two, weren't you? Channel Four. Oh, Channel Four, yeah. I do apologise. Yeah. I'm just about to say other channels are available. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Now, um, you'll, you'll be, you won't be joining us for part uh, three and four because um, you've got quite a prestigious appointment to rush off to in about 10 minutes time. You're going up to London, you're going yeah. to the House of Commons. That's correct. What are you, what are you doing up there, Sarah? So we have um, Mr. Tommy Mia, right. who is um, organising the um, 16th year of the um, International Indian Chef of the Year and the Curry Awards, which right. should be um, being hosted in November. Um, but it's supposed to, they, I think they're partnering with um, Virgin Trains 
Right. Um, and I know that the main competition will be taking place on a train going from um, King's Cross to York. Um, it's supposed to attract 20,000 um, people to sort of get involved in this competition. So it's going to, it's a very high profile and exciting thing that's going to happen. So the launch of it is today at the House of Commons. So that's the reason why I need to shoot off early. <laughs> right, so yeah, in about 10 minutes time, you'll be, you'll be rushing on the train up to London. Of course, today, uh, the recording of this programme uh, today is very, very busy because, of course, it's just been announced that there's going to be a, a general election in June. Yeah. So, of course, when you get up there, you're going to be going to be amongst the crowds, aren't they? The, yeah, the, I mean, uh, what can they really do, though? I mean, this, you know, it's yeah. been said that the, the election's going to happen and, and, uh, and yeah. it's going to happen. Yeah. And you've also mentioned, if anyone wants to, we won't go into it now, but if anyone wants to look up the curry crisis, um, yeah. you've been on the show and discussed this a couple of times yes. and you're part of that, UK that campaign Connect, as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but um, they can also find out about this, um, um, about the Curry Awards, Tommy Mears, International um, Chef of the Year, but they check online. So if anybody's interested, uh, wants to get involved, then, you know, just go online and have a look. Sounds yeah. delicious. I'm building up a voracious <laughs> well, am, appetite yeah. thinking about all this. Should we um, mm. do Indian instead of fish and chips tonight, Tony? <laughs> yeah, that would be nice, actually. It would be a good change. Uh, right, OK, so a um, couple of items here from the Isle of Wight. Um, press. The first one um, is computer hacking, something you worry about. Have you checked your anti-malware and virus software is up to date? One lady on the Isle of Wight was subject to a very aggressive hack, uh, took immediate action and was lucky. But of course, not everyone uh, will be. Are we too complacent about these things? Now, uh, this was Jennifer Edgington of Honeyhill uh, Newport on the island, turned on her laptop the other week. A message appeared on the screen saying she had been hacked and her computer had a virus with a phone number to call for help. Uh, the 44-year-old who volunteers for the Isle of Wight Food Bank actually said the laptop was totally frozen. It's not like getting an email you can just delete. I couldn't do anything except call the number. Um, the guy gave me instructions and took control of my computer and it was only then he asked me for money and I realised what was happening. Oh, so. Yeah. She couldn't do anything on her computer. The whole, mm. all there was on the screen was this number to call. She couldn't do anything else. Mm. Just, um, oh, that's a particularly violent <laughs> one, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, Nasty, yeah, I've heard of it? this one actually going around, and a lot of people said that. But vulnerable people are going to fall for it, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. You know, and then give this. I know my mum got a, a thing. It wasn't that one, but it was another one that someone rang and said that her computer there was, had a virus and it needed sorting and then ended up, she ended up paying money to them for nothing. Oh, you know, lucky there, it wasn't was a fortune. There was somebody just a few weeks ago that apparently was trying to contact many people saying that they owed him £30 or something like that. And this was some kind of viral thing going around the whole of the country or something. And, and he was, he he was achieving <laughs> he was achieving some success, oh, no. but I wasn't luckily going to fall for it. Thirty pounds, nothing. I'll pay no, but back. You don't end up with a fortune. Surely you would know. That's it. Yeah. If you lent, yeah, if you lent somebody anything, wouldn't you? Yep. You would, but, but if still, you, of course, yeah. it has an impact on you when you mm. receive it. You know, you're, you yeah. think about it, don't you? You can't not be yeah. impacted. Well, I think maybe I get you could argue. Um, some of those emails that say, or you know, like on on um, some of the social media sites, you get some people who say, oh. I need to speak to you, can I have your email address? And they make it really like, oh God, this thing's happened. And I'm like, I don't even know who you are. There's no, I, I don't want to know who you are. Just no, say where you are. Well, these ones where they say that they've got this, this, this huge amount of money that needs to be released to you. Yeah. And you that's don't know another, anything yeah, that's another about one. Yeah, it. Yeah. That's exactly. quite funny. Give though. us your bank details yeah. and I'm going to put all this money oh. hidden in your And it's always like, oh, we share it. Right. Yeah, yeah there's always somebody who's a um, South African diamond merchant yes. who's, um, mm. who's died and left everything to you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my yeah. God, really? Yeah. 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 But, and as um, soon as they ask for bank details, yeah. that's the sudden start of um, fatalities if people mm. fall for that. But Jennifer here, she, she wants to obviously let the public know what happened to her. She doesn't want it happening to other people. She was lucky. She didn't, she didn't lose a lot of money, but some people have. And so it's great that she's written into the newspaper Ooh. there. Do you think we're, we're too complacent? Do you think, I mean, do you check your antivirus software regularly? Would you be aware if it was out of date? 
Yeah, definitely. I, I've always had, uh, you know, soft. Well, you've got to these days, but mm. it, it's never always foolproof, though, is it? You know, I mean, they've reminded you enough times to to update it. But um, I think, like anything, there's always been scammers, whatever you do, mm. there's always trying something. Oh, yeah. And then people hear about it because everyone gives the word saying, oh, don't answer this or don't answer an email saying such and such. You, and then there's always something new coming in. Do you remember just a few months ago there was this new £5 note craze and so, so somebody just played a trick saying one of the notes had been de deliberately printed um, upside down and all he did really was have an, a, a correct fiver which he turned upside down and said look unique five pound note and people are going to fall for it and believe it. Right. Mm. Scary. Yeah, it's being hacked on your computer? Um, like. Not generally I mean I do remember about three years ago I, I, there was somebody that left quite a rude vulgar comment on one of my Facebook pages and I, I probably isn't wise I repeat it online no. but um, <laughs> I was quick to delete it and, and people warned me they said yeah there's a strange message that's come up and it's making it look like it came from you so I had to sort of make a big apology saying this didn't come from me this is an outside source. A lot of people have had that haven't they? Yeah. 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 And there's just so many, like you say, Facebook, so many fake accounts, aren't there? And you get mm. your friends then requesting another uh, friendship. And there's just, there's just so much going on, really. Yeah. Right. Luckily for me, it was a one-off case. You can see, like, for example, on Facebook, mm. um, when the picture of the girl is quite kind of provocative. Oh, yeah. Know, suggestive, and you realise yeah. it's uh, one of those dodgy... Um, mm. With no mutual friends. Friend yeah. 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 No mutual friends. Yeah. <laughs> or about five friends in total. Yeah. <laughs> I always get American servicemen, I don't like yeah. you. Yeah. Hundreds uh. of them, they always want to connect with you. <laughs> and some yeah. of the girls will have quite long legs and skirts up here. Mm. Really? Mm. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's just a gym. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a great pouch on. <laughs> Right, um, we've got about three or four minutes left and um, we are talking m the behaviour of motorcyclists. Now this is a letter that was written in to the Isle of Wight, uh, to an Isle of Wight newspaper from a gentleman uh, who lives in Cornwall but uh, who holidays on the island and he'd, he'd like to move to the island actually but he's often uh, put off by erratic and antisocial behaviour of motorcyclists who, who he says are treating the roads on the island like a racetrack. <laughs> And he thinks uh, the police can't come down um, hard enough on this. He's really angry um, about it. Now, the question that, 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 that uh, jumped out of this article for me is, are motorcyclists any more antisocial than motorists? Are they any worse? <laughs> no. On the law or of are they just as bad or just as good as... I suppose As it's motorists. when you've got a lot of them, they're quite loud, aren't they? That's <coughs> probably what he means, when they all go racing around, they're noisier than a few cars, aren't they? Yeah. Mm. My parents live in Bridport, and I know that those yeah. roads in those Cornwall areas are always a bit smaller. Mm. So what happens is sometimes you find when you're driving along a cyclist or motorcyclist, they're, they're riding their bike and they're, it, you know, they're doing it at their pace. But sometimes it does take over a bit of the road and you can't actually overtake right. them. Yeah. I mean, that can be kind of annoying. Mm. And I, th I think we, we, we've all... <laughs> but they need to get, get The writer out, of this they, letter... So. Yeah. What do you think about this comment? Um, the writer of this letter says um, that the police should arrest these people as soon as possible and destroy their machines at the earliest opportunity. <laughs> That's harsh. <laughs> That's too harsh. That's really extreme. Yeah. yeah. You were going to say something, Mike, uh, just before... Well, I, I, th I think... Well, I think about transport as a whole. I mean, you know, speaking from me being a man, I think we've all had moments where we've, you know, been boy racers. And again, in the female sense, I mean, I'm sure there's a, enough young women that have had moments that when they've been in their car, they've enjoyed putting their foot down. And I mean, I certainly know I have in my day. And, you know, but at the end of the day, it's logical to, to weigh up safety and noise pollution because you wouldn't want something like that happening at sort of two, three, four in the morning. Well, the writer of this letter it. describes no. them as gangs um, <laughs> and said um, <laughs> that it was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> he had um, a terrifying a experience with it, and he said, um, he I, and he yeah, he calls them hooligans, and um, yeah, because they're they're, they're racing, and uh, they're um, he's yeah. 
There was a brilliant very, comedy very horror famous. that was filmed in 1971 called Psychomania, and I recommend you watch it if you like that kind of thing, like the motorbike gangs, and, and they were called the Living Dead, and in reality, that's what happens, <laughs> and they all come back as Living Dead. And it came out, as I say, it was the start of the 70s, and Beryl Reed was in it, and it was one of those just magic films you can't help having a laugh about. Mm. Toddler hood days for me. It must be quite, con like, they must be really concerned about it for mm. them to write in, and it must, I mean, there must be something that we might be missing because we're not there, and maybe it's a small place and a, and maybe it's particularly quite a little bad on the sleepy Isle town, yeah. and suddenly, you know. Yeah. Maybe it's particularly bad on the Isle of Wight, maybe they've got more room, and um, they, he seems to think they're using the roads on the Isle of Wight like um, um, a, a race, a race course. Mm. We mm. always find, don't you, in that there's always this particular road that you see lots of motorcyclists because it's mm. that straight, fast road or, or whatever, so it might be just that's where he is. Mm -hmm. Right, well, um, we shall see you in a, in a few weeks' time, yes. uh, Sarah. Thank and obviously you. people can check, out, uh, check you out online and see what, um, you know, how, today, how, how tonight went. Yes, you're off to the House definitely, of Commons now. Um, yes. So, it's great to have you See again. You and, uh, yeah. yes. <laughs> Thank you. And you won't be late now, because no. uh, you're getting the train up there, aren't you? Yes, hopefully. From, from here in Portsmouth yeah. to London. Cosham, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> from Thank right you. here in Cosham. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Thank you. And if you've got news that we should be talking about, then do contact us on our email, talk at that .com, or send us a tweet using hashtag talk solid. Back with you again very shortly for more discussion and banter. Attention! Attention! Prisoner escape, cell block B! Alright, that explains it. Red Bull gives you wings. With the Glasses Direct Free Home Trial, get four pairs to try out at home for free. They're great. Test drive your new glasses today and see if you could save at Glasses Direct. And I want to take out a loan, so I need that website. That fantastic website! To check out the banks and lenders to find myself a canny deal. So, why the loan? I need a new saxophone. <laughs> Go compare! You're quite right, there's nothing quite like Go Compare! When you want to save it, should be your favourite. Oh, fantastic! Go Compare it, the com is right up there! <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic! <laughs> When it comes to family, we do anything to protect them. But if you were to pass away, would they be protected from the cost of paying for your funeral as well as other additional costs? If the answer is no, then the answer is a funeral protection plan from Promise Life. A simple, affordable way to protect your family financially. Because although the basic cost of a funeral can be over £4,000, there can be other related costs as well as legal fees. Together, these bills could come to over £7,500. But Promise Life can help protect against these costs with cover from just £7.1 a month. Payouts are fast, guaranteed within 48 hours, or you'll receive an extra £100. Acceptance is also guaranteed, and once you take out a plan, you'll receive a will kit absolutely free. So make a promise to protect your loved ones today and call Promise Life now on 0800 907 0800. Welcome back to Talk Solent. Joining me on the sofa today are Neshla Avey and uh, Mike Androsias. As, uh, of course, Sarah Ali Chowdhury has just had to rush off on the train to London for her appointment this evening at the House of Commons. Now, keeping it political, you might say, disability benefit changes have, have, of course, been controversial, often seem to be hurting those or at least causing stress and worry to those who genuinely need help and support. We're now examining a letter to a Southampton newspaper highlighting that some 900 people are losing their vehicles each week as mobility uh, scooters, etc. Many people have been moved from disability living allowance to personal independence payments. And during this transition, many have lost their mobility vehicles as the criteria have been changed for mobility vehicle eligibility based on how far someone uh, can walk. So, 
obviously very, very controversial. These sort of reforms, of course, you, you want them to, you know, do some good, but they often end up, you know, causing worry or even hurt to people mm. who, you know, yeah. really are genuinely dependent. Mm. That's right. Um, Mike, I think this is something that might get you fired up, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go on, this, try This me. subject, All right. you know, the disability mm. benefit changes, you know, they are, it is getting tighter. Mm. Obviously, we want to target people who should be targeted, but we don't want to be targeting people or hurting people who, who, no. need, who need the money. Absolutely. And a lot of people are losing their mobility vehicles now, you know, their mobility scooters, because they're deemed to be able to walk you know, a certain distance. Mm. Um, and we've gone from disability living allowance to personal, to, um, personal independence payment. Now, have you heard about this, uh, Mike? I haven't heard too much about it because I'm not tuned in very much to live television coverage. But I, I can believe it. I mean, I, I do watch a bit of TV from time to time and I look through newspapers and sort of see things that are going on. But it is very disturbing. Again, you see some of these financial restrictions, and it does seem that many people in power want to take, <coughs> you know, whatever's necessary or whatever might be just a little bit of enjoyment. People are just being so scrutinised. They're being really battered on some of the yeah. basic living things. You know, it just seems very unfair. And, of course, I can remember years ago when... Uh, the so-called DSS, now they call it, it used to be the DHSS, and you see the, one of the Conservative governments from quite long ago now dropped paying out on health. So DHSS became DSS. So it was all about economical cutbacks. So these sort of things have been going on for a long, long time. Should there be any reforms or any cutbacks at all to uh, disability allowance, disability I think, I think it's a very cruel thing. I think there's been enough cutbacks already, and frankly, I think people in need should be privileged and dealt with, you know, a bit better than they are. Are there any, are there any cases, do you think, Mike, where there should be cutbacks, where um, do you think there are certain people that should be penalised? If people are, people, in a sense, of being a bit no. dodgy and if they're tampering with the system and they're doing something illegally that could hurt others, in a moral sense and in a financial sense, it has to be looked into, obviously. But again, like so many things in the world, you, you're probably dealing with a small minority rather than the majority of people mm. that abide properly Even by the rules. Even if some people argue it's a sizable yeah. minority. Well, there's I mean, always one of those classic old signs, I suppose, yeah. where there's power, there's corruption, <laughs> which I'm afraid has truth yeah. behind it, yeah. isn't it, really? As outspoken yeah. as always, Mike, we love it. That's what we want on <laughs> yeah. talk. The John Lennon spirit. That's what I like, yes. <laughs> if I think something should be said, I'll say it. Yeah. And, uh, Mike, you, I mean, you do have, you have friends. You know, you've befriended a lot of people who, mm -hmm. you know, you met a lot of people who are really struggling. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. ESA, for example, in plant oh, support yes. allowance. Oh, you know, yes, that's right. People have been on that. Yeah. Um, and so, so many people genuinely need help but you think that you know there are people also that are abusing and milking the system I'm, I'm sure there are I mean if it was traced you know fairly um, compactedly that there, there, there'd be bound to be people out there that are sort of doing okay in secret and still claiming I'm sure it goes on mm. like everything really I mean I, I never go out of my way to be sort of unjust and unfair to any one particular I would never go out of my way to exercise spike towards anybody but um, as I say there are going to be people that are mucking about and you know not doing things the proper way and before we yeah. before we move on to um, Neshla who we haven't seen for uh, months to talk about uh, the link between mental illness and um, spirituality um, just briefly uh, a quick update on your Music, uh, Mike Andros, if so people want to go to SoundCloud, for example, mm -hmm. um, and of course to YouTube, other yep. similar websites are available. Uh, <laughs> we, you've had, there's loads of your stuff from the uh, 90s yeah. uh, on there, mm -hmm. but you've been in the studio quite a lot in the last few months. You've, you've uh, yeah. been producing some new tracks recently, haven't you, Mike? There was some co-production work I did with a, a really good guy called Louis, who was a brilliant sound engineer, and we were getting on great. And there are four brand new songs that have been 
quite recently recorded and I was very happy with the results. Yeah. It was tremendous fun to get back in after almost 20 years of proper original work before. Because some of the last stuff I did, original stuff, would have been latter 90s, 2000s. I always describe you as having a unique falsetto voice. Mm. Like. It's sounding quite good at the moment, and as I say, if it, it, on the warm sunshine and, and you know the air being pretty good at the moment, it does help. And one of your recent creations is, is actually about diet and health, isn't it? Balance your diet, eat sensibly, which we tried what to do Tam Tamla Motown-ish with temptation kind of influence, <laughs> and I was very pleased with the results of that. A bit like the Pupples of Rolling Stone. It had a little bit of that influence. Yeah, I've there. heard it. It's quite quirky. Yes. Yeah, and that's only a demo version. The proper <clears throat> cooked version, Louis has to just polish up around the edges. And you had quite a few likes on, on, on SoundCloud for that. That's interesting. You've got to be careful, all these website names, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. The SoundCloud, YouTube and Bandcamp. I think they were the that's three right. main ones I was Should with. we drop another website in? NeshlaAV.com. <laughs> <laughs> Neshla, N-E-S-H-L-A. A V A V Y. Um, oh, it's on the screen, isn't it? All one <laughs> word. dot com. Um, Neshla, um, it's been. We haven't seen you for a few months. It's great, um, you know, to get your take on um, this article here, which is actually an American article: spirituality, an underused tool in healing mental um, illness. And there's been a study published in the Psychiatric Rehabilitation Journal, which highlights the positive um, link. Um, between the two. Now, you know, destigmatizing mental health problems is, is central in the news at the moment, isn't it? So this is great, but surely this is obvious, isn't it? You know, well, you know the, <laughs> well, yes. the link between spirituality and, and dealing with a mental health problem. Yeah, because if, um, you know, and I, 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 I treat a lot of people because I do healing, as you know, um, and when I do healing, I do a lot on uh, people with uh, depression or, mm. or bipolar and things like that. And it just helps, um, you know, if they know there's a bigger picture and they've got some belief, that of course it's going to help lift your yeah. spirits and make you feel better. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, we all want something to believe in and we all want to understand ourselves better and have something yeah. out there. So whatever belief they have, it's got to be positive, hasn't it? I mean, it's a no-brainer, really, isn't mm, it? Mm. I mean, and, and also, um, Nesta, the, you know, the article here talks about how there's a stigma and how some people might not want to tell people in their place of worship or a religious leader about it because there is, unfortunately, tragically, still a bit of a stigma. Mm. Um, but it also talks about multi-denominational um, spiritual practices, so non-religious but just multi-denominational, yeah. um, that anybody can use, you know, for example, maybe, uh, what about meditation? Well, yeah, as I say, that's absolutely amazing because it just can help people switch off. And when you switch off that brain, that busyness and that worry and concern, then you've got to feel better, haven't you? Yes. If, yeah. if everyone did it, I mean, you know, there are even some schools doing it now, which mm. is wonderful, mm. just to switch off, because we're so busy these days, and if we, you know, nobody stops, you know, they're on no. computer games, or they're on their iPhones, or There's a lot of is, stress you know. and a lot of tension in the world today, and I think that's something, you know, quite noticeably, all three of us have seen increase over probably the past 10 or 15 <coughs> years. Because we're know. always trying to do 101 things at all once. At in once. the old days, we didn't have phones, we went out, we didn't get bothered, did we? That's now, right. Now, people are answering their phones wherever they are, they're making appointments, they're doing things, and you yeah. just don't get that. There's never enough hours in the day, is there, to do everything. And, of course, everything, it's yeah. going to stress people out. And, mm. uh, as I mm. say, by mm. doing meditation or, or even, you know, having healing or something like that, yeah. it just help people switch off and... Um, you know, mm. just recharge themselves, get themselves back into balance. So you do actually work, Neshla, with people who've, who've had anxiety, depression and other all types the time, of mental... All the time. With my, the healing I do, I mean, um, I get a lot of people with stress, I get a lot of people with anxiety, mm. um, uh, panic attacks, uh, depression, all of that sort of stuff, and it really helps them. I've seen a lot of people come off actually antidepressants. I wouldn't tell them to do that, obviously. That's the, you know their doctor's mm. tr decision, but it mm. does really help them recognise, you know, and put themselves back into a, a form of balance, mm. and then they help, you know, helps themselves. And would you promote exercise, maybe rather than antidepressants? Yeah, I, anything that makes you feel good. 
Mm. Anything that makes you feel good has got to be better than sick. But when you know when you're in that dark hole, I mean, I've never suffered myself, but I know, I've seen a lot of people that have. And as they say, when you're depressed, you don't want to do anything. Mm. So it's actually getting them to lift themselves out of it. But when you've got something positive, like a belief in um, some some form of spirituality, then you've got something to aim for. You've got something to live for, rather than just sitting in that dark hole. Yeah. Mm. So it's got to lift their spirits, and the more they they find out more about it, the more they get into it. It helps a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're going to come back to you, Nesha, after the break. We've got another fascinating article um, from the international press that I know you'll be very interested in, uh, very um, inspirational. And that's coming up uh, just after um, this. We've got, uh, we're just going to take a break uh, now and back with you again, of course, very shortly. During difficult times, it's good to know that Bupa Health Insurance is there for you and your family. Every move that I make, every we can help get you fast diagnosis and expert care should you need it. In my heart, in my soul, so you can focus on what's important. And with Bupa, families save 10% on health insurance. Call now on 0800 665 665 or search Bupa Family for more information. Oh, what's that? It's my new Flora Freedom. It's dairy-free. And delicious. Yeah, and all mine. <laughs> new dairy-free Flora Freedom. No moo or mmm. Oh, lavender and lino. <laughs> what a fight! <laughs> Kaplunk. <laughs> and, of course, complete privacy. Thanks, Mum, for the best memories ever. I wanted to do something special for your birthday, so I made you a moon pink card. I only ordered it yesterday. Happy birthday, Mum. Order by 7pm and we'll post it that day. Moonpink.com When it comes to family, we do anything to protect them. But if you were to pass away, would they be protected from the cost of paying for your funeral, as well as other additional costs? If the answer's no, then the answer's a funeral protection plan from Promise Life. A simple, affordable way to protect your family financially. Because although the basic cost of a funeral can be over £4,000, there can be other related costs as well as legal fees. Together, these bills could come to over £7,500. But Promise Life can help protect against these costs with cover from just £7.01 a month. Payouts are fast, guaranteed within 48 hours, or you'll receive an extra £100. Acceptance is also guaranteed, and once you take out a plan, you'll receive a will kit, absolutely free. So make a promise to protect your loved ones today, and call Promise Life now on 0800 907 0800. Hello, you're watching Talk So. Let me on the sofa today are Neshla Avey and Mike Androsias. Now, let's go over to Neshla once again for her take on an esoteric article from booksworld.com. Janet Gant is the author of a new book which seeks to provide concrete evidence of the powers and validity of tarot cards, clairvoyance, and divination. The book recounts true stories of people who visited readers and what the actual outcomes were. Janet Gant was going through a very rough period in her life when somebody suggested she visit a tarot reader. The reading was, she says, uncannily accurate um, in detail. Neshla, this um, book is entitled The Paranormal, uh, True Stories and the Outcomes, and these are, it's a collection of experiences and cases of people who've been to clairvoyance and how, um, you know, what they've been told has been incredibly ac an accurate reflection of what's going on and, um, and how the outcomes have been exactly as they were predicted. Yeah. Now, people often do try and prove um, this sort of thing, but can you really substantiate the validity of a tarot reading? <laughs> Is this something that we can prove, Neshla? Well, it's very difficult to say so. I mean, I can say to you, I've done lots of readings over the years and people have come back to me and said, oh my goodness, what you said about this has come true or mm. you were right about this. But 
It's very difficult to prove that's between me and my client because my client knows I'm telling the truth and my client knows that I've helped them because it's all about helping people. Yeah, I think yeah. if I wrote a book and said my experiences with my clients and what the outcome was, um, I still wonder, will people believe that? You know, I, and I think doing the job that I do, it's very difficult to prove and there's a lot of people that are very anti. So the main thing is I can help people that want my help. You know, mm. um, so I think writing a book, yeah, you're going to get people read it, but you're going to still get the skeptics and say, oh, yeah. well, how can that happen? And mm. uh, people say, oh, well, you've told somebody that you're going to meet somebody with blonde hair and blue eyes next week, so they go scouting for them, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. And, you know, mm. so how can you prove it? It's a very difficult thing, and I think over the years, a lot of people have been trying to prove that it works. And one of the most common, um, well, I Accusation is a strong word, but one of the most common objections is that clairvoyants tell people what they want to hear, or they only tell people the good stuff. Yeah. That again, what do you again, think about that, Michelle? Well, it's very difficult. I mean, there are people out there. There are people that just want to make some money, because like in any, any form of business, it's all about, you know, some people, they've always got someone that just wants the money, they tell you what you want to hear, and then nothing will happen, and mm. uh, then you get disappointed. However... I feel, you know, sometimes we have to tell people bad news. It's not all about good stuff, but I try and make people feel positive. So even if there's something negative, I will always look it further and try and give something positive because mm. like, that's life all in general, isn't it? We yeah. always have uh, negative aspects, but it's not always going to end like that. You no. know, your whole life, it might feel like your world's ending at a certain time, but then I can look forward and say, but, the, you know, in a few months' time, this is likely, you know, might ha will happen and then everything, you'll look back and it's going to be okay. It's like anything in life, we get redundant and everyone panics, That's I've right. lost my job. But then we see later on, we look back and think, well, actually, I'm glad because I've got a better job. Mm. Certain things sort of thing. were meant to happen it's for a reason. Exactly. Everything happens for a reason, it's something I've exactly. said. That's how we learn time. and grow, isn't it? Because yeah, otherwise, if well, life went too smoothly for all of us, then, you know. wouldn't appreciate much. But that's when it? they come and see me, when they've got a problem, when their husband's left them, or, you know, or they're thinking of leaving their husband, or whatever it is, because then they just want that reassurance they're doing the right thing. Because a lot of people don't like making decisions on their own so you just can give them the guidance that it's going to be okay or you know don't go down that road or whatever it is and it just makes people feel better people often people who object to this kind of thing often talk about cold reading and what's what's that well again that's uh, you know a lot of people will ask you the question for example so they'll ask you the question and they guess that you hear about people you know I've had people come to visit me take their wedding ring off because they think that I'm going to look at their hand you know and know they're married and even people say oh I didn't give um, one lady wrote me enough lovely testimonial and she said um, I didn't give her my my surname um, and she was just one name she said because I didn't want her to look me up on Facebook I mean you know have I got time to do that you know I don't want to waste my time doing that I'd rather do something else you know and it's it's a hard job to do really because it's quite responsible but also the same time it's uh, it's difficult because there, there is no proof mm. in forms of spiritism and power I mean again this is something I can relate to to a certain degree because I've had certain powers that over the years it seemed to have been given to me where I've had premonitions of visions of things that have actually happened mm. and yeah. a lot of it's been beyond my control and I was looking at a book not so long ago about um, stately homes and big country houses and um, I came across Blickling Hall in Norfolk which I'd obviously heard about for some length of time and the, w the name Robert just came into my head and I kept concentrating on the name Robert for some reason. I turned the page and it turned out, through no outside knowledge of my own, that two separate people under the name of Robert had owned and been in control of that building. Mm -hmm. And I even watched one of the most haunted um, programs not so long ago. And Derek O'Carroll, he picked up on the year 1704. Now, before he said this, about a minute before, I was concentrating on the very early reign of Queen Anne and the year 1703 came into my head and I had no outside knowledge of what he was going to say a minute later. And we were literally a year apart. But also, Mike, you, are, you have quite a, a religious bent uh, to you. Yeah. Actually. What do you think about, about some of the, of the negative religious views towards this kind of thing? Do you think they're justified? How do you feel about those? Well, it's, that's a really interesting point because that not for one moment would I ever want to do anything to, to offend what the belief of Jesus or the Almighty God believes in his own way, but 
but but from some of the things that that's being mentioned it, it's a little bit of a, a double-edged sword for me because I am fascinated by the subject of the paranormal and supernatural mm. to a certain degree, and I do so have a few books. I believe that ghosts exist, and I've bared witness to mm. ghostly phenomenon. But at the end of the day, if I told that to some of the Christian religions, mm. that they would visualise me as a Satanist, that they would, would paint six 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 over me for saying that. Right. <laughs> they probably would. Would you? Would you have faith in, in Nesla to be able to tell you when that, that, that uh, you know, Miss Wright is, or Mrs. Wright is going to come along? Well, I definitely think there are some, some true accurate relevances in right. clairvoyancy, so, that yeah, there is yeah, certainly yeah. truth in it. Nesla, what yes. do you normally say to...